Thanks for your time, guys. Really appreciate it. Um, today, we're going to cover um, uh, primarily focus on uh, ClearCom's new uh, Edge wireless intercom, um, these guys here. But as it pertains to, uh, to our matrix intercom, so we have a small frame here and a panel. And um, we're going to talk a little bit about all the different pieces that go together to, uh, to make a system like this work. So we have some LQ boxes and HelixNet and, uh, and those kind of things. And, and we're going to talk about how, what they are individually, but how they all tie into the system and, and you know, some of the unique features that they can add as well. Um, so yeah, feel free to ask any questions. It's a small group today, so don't hesitate to interrupt if something uh, you know, stirs your mind. But uh, otherwise, you, know, you can wait till the end, but uh, I'm happy to answer them uh, anytime. So um, we, we find ourselves in quite a, a number of different locations, um, some interesting ones down the States, uh, specifically a lot of sporting venues and sports related stuff. Um, but uh, up here in Canada, we've also got a number of nice uh, installations around the GTA and, uh, and even across the, uh, across the country. But again, a lot of sporting uh, central stuff as well. So um, if uh, you're Toronto folks, um, TFO, the Weather Network, and both Montreal and, and Oakville, um, Scotiabank Arena, downtown Toronto, um, uh, Scotiabank Place, and is that what it's called in Ottawa? I'm, I can never remember the name. I still think of it at the Corral Center. Um, NTV in Newfoundland, and we've got a couple uh, more uh, portable productions that get used uh, for different shows like MasterChef Canada and Canada's Worst Driver and, and stuff like that. So, um, but we do find ourselves in some fairly mission critical stuff. So there's quite a large deployment of ClearCom at SpaceX down in, uh, down in the States, um, as well as NASA and uh, our counterpart, the Canadian Space Agency. Uh, we actually have a very intelligent link between the Montreal location and uh, down in Houston. And uh, most recently, I had, the, I had the fun job of working on a project with, uh, with Bruce Power. So they have the single largest deployment of uh, wireless belt packs in the world uh, with over four, 450 um, belt packs and 50 transceivers in a, basically in a square mile. So we can talk about that one a little bit later on if uh, anybody has any questions. So. One of the, uh, the big parts of what we're going to be talking about today is our IP technology. Uh, most recently, this kind of led the way and uh, has kind of paved a path for all of the different things that we can connect. Um, so we have a, a leading edge AES67 and SMPTE 2110 based uh, a network card. Um, this gives us the ability for uh, real-time communications uh, via this protocol, but also uh, some wide area options for uh, links across the world or different parts of a building or, you know, or questionable uh, connections. Uh, we also support very high density links. Um, so most of our cards can do up to 64 channels per. Uh, and these days, since everything is uh, primarily IP based, in our case, one, uh, one uh, card will support uh, panels, um, SIP connections, mobile apps, and in this case, wireless belt packs. And one of the best things about all of this is that this technology or the core behind this was developed in Canada, actually in Montreal. So um, the head of ClearCom's R&D team is in Montreal and any IP development is done there. So <laughs> as, uh, as time has gone by, more and more is, is IP related. So more and more gets uh, facilitated out of that office. So that card uh, for us um, supports SMPTE 2110. Um, so we do AES67 for panel connectivity and, and things like antennas, um, but we support full PTP version 2, 2110-10, 2110-30, and 31 um, connections. So we can do streams from other sources uh, and generate streams to other devices uh, from this. So in our case, um, today we're using a, uh, the heart of our system is an Eclipse Delta matrix. Um, it's a card-based frame, obviously, with four slots. So this gives us the capability to support up to 256 ports in these uh, four RU. And it has a built-in um, redundant uh, CPU and uh, redundant power supply. And uh, as far as the actual cards go, um, we can locate this and, and fill this up with uh, one of them we call an MVX card. 
and this is a 16 channel uh, analog I.O. card, basically 16 RJ45s on the back um, that we can wire up to just program audio, line level audio feeds, uh, anything analog. Um, but we can also connect things like panels to this as well. So this is kind of a legacy protocol for that kind of thing, but is totally supported for, for anything these days. Uh, we have our IPA card, which we're going to talk about in a second. And um, this is a, a card that supports up to 16 uh, to 64 channels. Uh, totally IP-based IP protocol. So uh, this is going to be a kind of a mainstay of what we're looking at today. And uh, additionally, we have a Dante card that supports up to 64 channels, as well as a MADI card. So <clears throat> the, IP, uh, the IPA card um, does most of what we're going to be talking about today. And uh, so this, of course, does the AS67-2110 variant. But we also have a kind of a sidebar to that that we call IBC. Um, and we'll talk about that in a minute. This is a uh, licensable card too, so you can buy it um, in chunks of, of 16 channels. So if you start off with 16 and you realize you need to move to 32 or 48 in the future, uh, you can call us up and, and buy the, basically pay the difference and we'll send you a license code to upgrade that. So it's the same hardware in all cases. Uh, it's just a question of how many channels that you, uh, that you need. One unique thing you'll notice is that it does have uh, six LAN connections on the back. Four of them are on uh, Cat5, and two of them are on uh, SFP, so you can do fiber fiber based connection. This allows us to segregate the networks. Um, since this card does so much for us in, in the way of um, supporting mobile clients and supporting wireless intercom, we can designate a LAN port for each of these connections so that those networks can stay separate, and uh, and their security between them is you know, intact and, and what it was meant to be. Uh, and we can also support uh, a sync connectivity for multiple systems. So you'll notice these two jacks here are uh, legacy sync ports to tie in some of our existing free speak systems and, and things like that. So uh, they'll all play nicely together and they won't, uh, they won't, you know, intentionally interfere with each other. As far as our panels go, um, one of the unique ones is a uh, uh, what we call a, a, a V32 lever panel. So it has 32 uh, lever keys. This is a nice transition for those that are familiar with uh, the RTS uh, KP32 panels. Um, I mean, so this was an obvious transition for, for a lot of those. Um, we also have a, a unique option that we, uh, that we do as well called a, a rotary panel. So uh, this is kind of neat in the sense that instead of a lever up and down, talk, listen, we actually have a, a push, push button rotary here to engage a listen uh, with a volume control. And then we also have a dedicated talk button per channel. So it's a very easy and very clear way to see who, who you're talking and listening to and to you know, make volume adjustments to uh, each of those different sources. So we have a couple of different form factors as well too. This is one of my favorites. It's a, uh, it's a 12 um, position uh, desktop station, so it doesn't need to be rack mounted. It's a nice throw down desktop kind of unit. So this variant is a, uh, is a rotary one, um, but you'll notice it also has a, um, a keypad too. So if you're doing any kind of uh, dialing out to a phone system or a SIP system or something like that, you can, you can utilize that uh, right here as well. And then uh, uh, one of the coolest things I think is the, uh, is the Agent IC app. So this functions very much just like a regular panel, um, but supports um, <clears throat> Android and iOS uh, phones or tablets. Um, so you can program up to 24 keys through the matrix and have access to those endpoints um, via your phone. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that uh, a little bit later. And they've just recently announced something that we're calling Station IC. And this is a desktop variant of the Agent IC app. So it's Mac or PC compatible, and again, supports up to 24 programmable keys uh, within it. So. so one of the things I wanted to talk about um, is uh, that IVC and, and some of our panel options, because I think these are kind of unique um, to deploying systems either in, in local areas or, or across the world. So on the back of, of every of these panels that you buy, um, we have uh, the traditional option and the legacy option to just plug in a straight Cat5 cable and, and go to our MVX port and just do it you know, via an analog connection, just balanced audio in and out. 
But we also have the ability through our, our, our network jack here um, to support the AOIP or AES67 kind of real time uh, uncompressed format. Um, but uh, the unique one here is something called IVC. And this is a third option uh, for every panel that you have. And this is kind of a, a variable or a kind of in between the analog and the, <clears throat> the real time AS67 variant where you don't require, you know, a PTP master clock, you don't require, you know, very stringent network uh, uh, things. Um, this will literally run over a, a 3G or a 4G internet hub or, you know, so there's really no requirements for making this work. If you've got a, you know, if you've got a, a valid internet connection that can support a, a few kilobits per second, you know, you can make this panel work. So when you get one of these and when you deploy one, you have the option of doing an analog, AOIP or IVC, and that can be different per, which is, which is definitely a really nice option. So, for some other endpoints, um, we uh, we're going to talk about uh, our LQ boxes, and uh, these were initially developed to be point-to-point -point bridges between different locations uh, over standard IP. Um, but they also kind of threw in the point-to-multipoint thing, where you could create a very large party line system uh, between many different locations. We have uh, two and, and four wire variants. Um, so you can just tie in belt packs directly with these units. And um, if you look at the back here, this is a, uh, one of our uh, two wire variants here. So these are just straight uh, ClearCom based uh, uh, XLRs. And you can power up to 10 of our RS series belt packs right off the back here. So you don't need an additional power supply or anything else. But uh, we have options like uh, integrating two-way radio. So we can get one of these that has two DB9s here with uh, a relay, uh, an accessible relay, so that you can queue up the, uh, the PTT circuit in the radio. Um, we also have the ability to tie in uh, up to eight channels of uh, uh, VoIP connectivity or SIP uh, lines. And um, if you're not using a matrix and you want to do this kind of standalone, uh, we can actually license up to eight agent IC users right off the LQ box. So one of these LQ boxes can actually do all three of these things by itself. Uh, depending on how you equip it. And uh, one of the neat things is um, we actually have a guy in, uh, in, in Toronto um, and what he did was he bought uh, an LQ box like this for film production use uh, and he just added the Agent IC uh, licenses to it. And um, basically he sets up his cameramen and they log in with their phone. And initially he had just used this box in his basement and they would just connect out over the internet uh, from their phone to his basement and use that for production purposes on a live set. So, you know, you'd be talking to a guy, you know, 10, 15 feet away, but that would be going, you know, out over the cell network back to his house and then back again. Um, and it was, it was very usable. You know, it's not something that's very obvious, but it's a very cool uh, solution. And uh, that's what he's using uh, for his, uh, his production these days, so. So this slide kind of emphasizes the different endpoints that we can, you know, put at a distance. So, you know, there's a lot of IP protocols these days, but a lot of them are real time SMPTE 2110 and they're not the easiest to deploy out over the internet. Um, whereas using that IVC technology we talked about, we can place panels, a, a mobile app connectivity uh, or our LQ boxes out in the field and then daisy chain belt packs, um, radios, uh, integrate with uh, other systems as well. All this can be done either locally or across the world if you want to. We have a few situations where, um, you know, we have a frame based in one location like Toronto and it's supporting wireless belt packs, things like that, and panels, of course. Um, but, you know, somewhere across the world, uh, out over a standard internet connection, we can support those same endpoints, uh, LQ boxes and, and mobile apps. So nothing else is required, uh, just a valid internet connection, no kind of gateways, nothing special, just a, just a standard connection. So one of the other things that we're gonna talk about is our, our HelixNet party line. Um, this is nothing new, um, but it's basically a digital version of the old analog system. And the idea was that it would uh, drop into existing locations with existing infrastructure and uh, give yourself the flexibility of multiple channels carrying across a single XLR or, or in, in these days, Cat5 lines. Um, 
So uh, the idea was that uh, you could drop in a new base station, new belt packs, and not have to touch the infrastructure. So it's built very rigidly to support any kind of cabling infrastructure or, or uh, you know, 40 or 50 year old, uh, you know, 84, 51 installs. Uh, one of the nice things is that everything is PoE powered and deployed that way. And uh, we can support up to 24 channels of IO um, through the system. And if we integrate our LQ boxes, we can do uh, SIP and VoIP calling um, and uh, integrate it into our matrix platform as well with multi-channel links. So these days, um, most of our deployments are, are network-based, but this diagram is kind of showing a main station, uh, a couple of belt packs over Cat5, one of our small stations, and then a fiber link to another switch in a different part of the building um, where we then have another main station, uh, FreeSpeak here as well, and, and some of our, our belt packs uh, again over Cat5. So this one's web-based, so it's a very easy and, and very straightforward system to, uh, to program. So as part of our system today, we actually have our HelixNet tied in uh, to our matrix and can show you how that all looks. And the big thing that we're talking about uh, and the big interest these days is Edge. And so Edge is our latest generation of, of wireless uh, free speak belt packs. Um, the big difference with Edge is that uh, it operates at the 5.8 uh, gigahertz range. So that occupies the same bandwidth as some of the uh, Wi-Fi services available. Um, but one of the nice things is it's a, it's a very large uh, and, and very capable band. So um, we don't need a whole lot of space and we'll talk a little bit about you know, some of those requirements there. As well, uh, we do support up to 12 kilohertz of audio band. So that's another 5K over uh, even our previous generation and most of the competitive systems. Uh, and that's, that's using the Opus codec. So it's a very nice and, and very linear, uh, linear sound. It's really no bigger than our existing belt pack, which is kind of nice. It's got, obviously got a color screen and uh, we actually have nine programmable buttons available. So we have our standard A, B, C, D buttons, um, but we also have these four buttons across the top here uh, and they can be programmed as additional talk or point-to-point -point destinations. Uh, normally, as you can see in this picture here, they're done as call signals uh, for these respective channels, but again, they can be overridden and, and done as directs. And um, it also has a, a built-in speaker and a microphone, so you can drop it down on a, on a desktop and, and you know, use it without a headset. Um, it's got uh, Bluetooth LE capabilities for real-time headset connectivity. And we're seeing about 14 hours of real-time use per, uh, per battery charge. As far as the transceivers go, um, this is what these guys look like. Um, one of the big things with this new uh, uh, band is that we can now support up to 10 belt packs per antenna, uh, which is really nice. That really changes our density requirements and, and things. Um, this is a S67 base, so it's IP network. Uh, we can either go in Cat5 um, via PoE-powered uh, uh, inlet jack here, uh, but we also have an SFP uh, on board. And one of the unique things you can do is uh, you can do a line from a, um, a fiber switch directly to the antenna, and then you can actually daisy chain from the antenna out via the Cat5 line to another one close by. Um, they put some mic stand mounts for easy portable mounting. And uh, the, the most obvious one of this is that you can actually take off the, uh, uh, the antennas. And, and in this case, they've actually exposed them. So these antennas do come off, um, they can be moved, and you can actually put some higher gain antennas on the, uh, on the units themselves. These are just uh, TNC connections. Um, so that was something that we had always wanted to see in, uh, on, the, uh, on the FreeSpeak line, um, but they've now made it possible. So these are just a standard you know, 3 dB gain uh, antenna set here, but you could easily put a high gain 10, 15 dB you know, patch antenna or panel or something like that on it. So you'll also notice too that um, that's a fairly robust enclosure. So this can be mounted outside. Um, there's, a, uh, there's no fans in these guys. You can see, you can see through that here. Let's see if I get it. It's actually kind of a uh, pass through and this creates a chimney effect up the unit. Uh, for cooling purposes. So um, very few things can, uh, can fail in this case. And uh, yeah, very, very nice little unit. And we're seeing a very similar range to our 1.9 variants. Uh, we're seeing about 200, 200 meters uh, line of sight from the antenna uh, in, in outdoor applications. Obviously that changes inside of a building and, and with steel and concrete structures, but we're seeing very similar to, uh, to that with 
with our options. And we're also uh, talking about FreeSpeak 2. I mean, it's, this is not a new thing for us today, um, but uh, uh, we do, uh, I did want to showcase the fact that um, we can run these systems uh, on the same frame. Um, so today we have a variant of 5.8 gig edge belt packs and a couple of 1.9 FreeSpeak belt packs allocated. So we can co-locate and co-operate together. So. Um, uh, and part of that is uh, with this new uh, IPT transceiver. Um, this allows us uh, very much like the edge to um, connect in by an AS67 based network. Uh, it does support up to 10 belt packs per transceiver as well. Um, we have the same kind of daisy chain options, things like that. So, um, and as you can see, we have a little bit, uh, a little bit more range from these guys, um, but very similar uh, in outdoor situations. Uh, chargers. Uh, batteries, things like that. Uh, nothing, nothing too special here, but we do have a, a four port uh, four bay charger where you can drop the whole belt pack in, or you can take the batteries out separately and uh, charge them in the same slot. Um, and like a cell phone, you know, we're seeing uh, somewhere between, uh, you know, in 15, 20 minutes of charging, um, you know, you see a good 50% of the battery and it does take another, you know, two to two and a half hours to get the, the full charge. And as I mentioned before, we're seeing about 14 hours of, of battery life per, per unit. <clears throat> now I want to talk about um, frequencies for a second here, because uh, I think uh, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of things going on these days. Uh, you know, we have systems that operate in, uh, in, in many different versions. Uh, FreeSpeak uh, gives us the ability to do 1.9, 2.4, and 5.8 gig. Um, so you can, you can literally choose based on your requirements. Um, but one of the unique things about this, this new product, Edge, is that it actually gives you the ability to do some coordination. Um, belt packs that operate in 1.9 and 2.4, um, they don't allow coordination uh, in the way that you know, we're, we're, we're typically used to doing it. Uh, if you operate at 1.9, there's a 10 megahertz span um, and if you, want to, if you want FCC and Industry Canada approval, um, you have to abide by their, 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 uh, their slot requirements and their channels. And, and the same thing at 2.4, you know, if we have a 2.4 gig uh, device, you know, we have to use a frequency hopping spread spectrum kind of a mentality and we can't actively avoid those, those frequencies, at least legally. <laughs> Some people do it other ways, but uh, not, not legally. Um, at 5.8, we have the same kind of things. We have a much wider band um, but we actually have the ability to specify and, and to choose what bands we want to use. So the antennas, these edge transceivers will actually um, specify a, uh, they'll actually automatically scan the 5.8 gig band and pick uh, frequencies that are available and uh, not in use already. Uh, but you also have the ability to go in and, and choose those later on if you want to change it, or you can also coordinate with the IT department and they can say, okay, we're going to use these 10 channels for our, our, um, our transceivers for Wi-Fi, and you guys have everything from, you know, this, this band and up basically. So lots of channels and, and lots of stuff that we can, uh, we can take advantage of, but you can have the best of both worlds. You can either manually do it or you can let the system pick, but you have the choice. And obviously, I think most of you guys know this is a distributed system. So, you know, we create uh, we create cells with antennas to support numbers of belt packs, and obviously with the ability to to roam between them. One of the big things that um, we found very useful these days is uh, is what we call our roles, uh, and our roles are are basically um, you know different people uh, or different uh, jobs. So it can be called by name or or by uh, or by function of the day, basically. But you know, we, we have no limit to the number of roles that you can have in a system. Um, so you could have 50 roles and 10 belt packs. And as you power each belt pack up, you can decide you know, what role that you want to choose you know, based on what you're doing. Um, and like this graphic shows, you get a, a list of uh, possible selections. And then when you grab it, you, know, you, you, you go into that role with those uh, specific characteristics. And the nice part with that is that all of your settings for your belt pack, your, your mic gain, your side tone level, you know, your, even your listen levels or your relative listen levels between the channels, that's all, that stays all part of the role. So 
you know, if you want your if you want to use your belt pack a certain way, you don't have to be tied to a specific piece of hardware anymore. You can pick up any one of the belt packs, grab your roll, and you know you'll be into your specific settings. So we have a couple of uh, installs that we we mentioned at the beginning, and um, have a couple of diagrams. I just wanted to run through to show you how the systems kind of get deployed. So at the MTS Center in Winnipeg, they have a, a Delta frame. Um, with one of our MBX carts, and that does analog tie-in. Um, so just program inputs, uh, IFB outputs, things like that, just by analog sources. Uh, they also have one of our IPA carts. Um, so that's doing uh, panel connectivity for their V12R DDX desktop units. Uh, and then um, they also have one of our legacy wireless intercom uh, EQ cards. And that supports the traditional free speak uh, um, antennas and, and things that are very common, you know, uh, typically with uh, standalone bases. Uh, but they can obviously be used with the matrix as well using that card. And then they've also purchased some uh, agent IC licenses to roam around the, the building with uh, uh, just on the standard Wi Fi. And we have something similar in, um, in Montreal. It's a little less complicated, not as much IP, but it's a Delta frame as well. Panels are connected over analog in this case. Um, and then they're using their, um, their EQ card uh, for four antennas throughout the bowl. So we have a FreeSpeak 2 system covering the, the venue with more, a lot more bell packs than this, but just this just as shown. And then um, uh, in uh, downtown Toronto, just off Young, um, TFO has a fairly large system uh, using our larger median frame, just more card slots in this case. Um, they have 13 of the V24 rotary panels and 13 of the 12 uh, 1RU versions. Um, they're all connected in uh, and using our uh, legacy card, the, oops, sorry, the uh, IVC32 card. We also have the EQ card for wireless. So they have three transceivers and six belt packs to roam around their two studios. Uh, and they went a, an extra step and they included a MADI card in to tie in their broadcast console as well. So they're able to deliver all of their um, basically pre-fade listens of all the talent um, into the intercom system so that they can be monitored regardless of, you know, what the console or the mixer is doing. And um, they have a couple of remote locations and uh, what they've done uh, in Ottawa, for example, is placed one of our V24 panels using that IVC protocol. And one unique thing you can do with that is you can actually trunk two additional channels in that IP stream. So we have one main channel for the, for the panel uh, going back over the internet to the Toronto office, but we've actually tagged on two extra channels and tied in a wireless intercom system in the Ottawa location. Um, so that's kind of a neat, discreet way to uh, basically use the panel as a gateway, you know, something you already have there and something you can continue to use, uh, but we're just trunking and, and doubling up some additional channels of audio on the back end. And then this system here, um, the, the one that we're using today actually had a purpose in mind as kind of a field kit for the CBC. And um, so this, uh, this frame was originally built with uh, one MBX card uh, for just analog tie-ins. So these RJ45s are broken out to uh, a 2RU 24XLR uh, plate, basically, or sorry, a 16XLR plate. Um, we've put our 16 port IPA card in there, and that does uh, up to, it's doing 10 bell packs for us using three of our transceivers. Um, we've also put in a Dante and a Matty card. So we're actually using the Dante card to tie into the RTS Omnio system. And we're using the MADI card to tie into their Digico consoles. And then since we're only using 10 belt packs, we still have six ports of the IPA card available for use. Um, so we have one of our desktop stations and four of our agent IC licenses available. So just to show a little bit of the, uh, a little bit of the flexibility. So. so does anybody have any questions uh, so far with everything I've mentioned? Everybody still awake? <laughs> Hey, just quick, sorry, it's Adrian, about the agent I see or the agent-based uh, panels there, or sorry, yeah. app-based panels. The, um, so what card does that actually, is that running on off of the AES67 card? I, I, I think I missed that. Yep, yep. Um, what I'll do is I'll uh, go back here. So this card here, the IPA card, 
is kind of our, our primary IP based card these days. So it supports the AES 67 part um, for things like our, our, um, our antennas. And you can obviously run our panels that way as well. But it also supports that IVC protocol. And it's that protocol that allows us to do the kind of mobile or out over the internet, uh, so to speak, uh, language. Um, so you have six, in this case, you have 16 ports available and they can be, you know, belt packs, uh, they can be agent IC, they can be regular panels, anything on, on that card basically. So I'll show you in the software here. That, that's the next, uh, the next part we're gonna look at, so. Gotcha, thanks. Yeah, no problem. So um, jump around here. I'm going to show you the EHX programming software and show you how this uh, how this all works. You guys see this okay, or is it a little a uh, little off? No. So. Um, when you boot the software up, um, you're kind of brought to this page that we call the layout page. And this represents uh, any of the matrices that might be part of your, your setup. So it's common to have uh, obviously at least one of these, but you can have a whole bunch of these guys in this pane. And um, this is where you decide how you want to link them together and, and do all that. Uh, but today uh, we're just using one. And you can see I've named it Gear Demo. So that's what the frame is called. Uh, there's only one matrix, so it's called itself the first one. and um, we have uh, basically a valid configuration that shows up in this box here. Uh, and this represents exactly what, um, uh, what particular file or particular show that you're using uh, today. And these can change at any given time and within a few seconds, if you like. And then down below, we have our, our IP address for our, uh, our matrix here. And uh, so if you click on this, you can do things like firmware upgrades. Uh, you can do a uh, change your IP settings of the frame, just some just general, very basic kind of stuff. But that block translates to something we see over here uh, in this window. Um, so this, this frame itself is uh, represented by this guy on the side here. So if you do have multiple matrices, they will show up as different blocks down the left-hand column here. So as you can see um, here, I have my, my frame, my configuration, which I did a horrible job at naming. <laughs> um, I can decide to pull in the map that's in the matrix. So I can pull in what, what's actually running actively now. Uh, or I can take what I have in the software and I can apply it down to the frame. Um, but as you can see, this guy's lit green. So I can tell by my legend here that uh, the project that I'm using and, and what's in the matrix are matching. So it's a good place to start. And then um, down the left-hand side here, we've kind of, we're kind of broken up by three categories, kind of our hardware setup, our configuration, which is all of our soft options. And then we have some uh, really nice and unique diagnostics. So under hardware, uh, our first and most important menu is our cards and ports section. So this represents uh, exactly uh, the four cards that you see uh, in the matrix. So you can see in this particular case here, our top two cards are, are my CPU cards, my, my main and my backup unit. Um, you can see the top, the top one here has uh, got a few more blinky lights on it. So it's our master card at the moment. Um, but this other one is sitting standby, ready to go. And then my next card here is, uh, is my IV or my my MVX card. So I have my 16, you can see 16 amber lights on there that represent my analog ports. And then I've got uh, another one below, which is my IPA card. And then I've got a Dante card located at the very bottom. So nothing in the third slot there. And I can see the same thing uh, here as well. So my MVX card, my IPA card, and the Dante card. If you click on each one of these, you can see the port count for, for this. So this guy has 16 ports. And um, each one of those ports has a function. So uh, if I click on the drop down here, this, these could be things like uh, uh, we have a device called the CCI 22, which ties in legacy party line systems. Uh, we have an AES card. Um, we can do uh, integration with SIP and we can do all of our panels here as well. But for today, and, and what's usually most interesting these days with this is just standard analog in and analog out of the matrix. And, and that's something we call direct ports. So you can see these 16 ports are, are set up as directs. I can throw a label on it, um, whatever this happens to represent. And then I can type in a description, of course, of any, any number of characters. 
if I select that row, I get some advanced properties on the right-hand side. And this is where we can do things like, um, you, you'll notice this one has a, a, what we call a split label. So it's got this uh, red section here and it's got this green section. We, so we split the label in half to represent the fact that, uh, you know, this could commonly be used by like an IFB uh, program input uh, in the green side as a, like a line input to the system. And in this case, the red output, which would be the talent feed um, using just those straight analog cards. So um, this gives us the ability to say, you know, this, this input is program one, uh, but this output might be talent number, you know, one or two or whatever it happens to be. And it doesn't have to match up. Um, you know, these, these two ports, can, this port has an input and an output, obviously, and it can be treated separately. Um, but we've got things like gain options, so we can adjust the level, uh, tally options, uh, and there's a voice operated switch available as well too. So we can have uh, audio gated out under a certain threshold and once it passes over, we can have it open up and also, uh, and also trigger an event. So that's pretty straightforward, nothing, nothing super interesting there. Um, the more interesting one obviously is the IPA card. So um, this guy is a 16 channel card, so it shows up here with our 16 available. And um, this gives me the abil ability, to, same idea where I can basically add ports as required, um, but you can see the list is uh, even longer. Um, and uh, all of these are IP centric devices. So um, I can do SMPTE 2110 streams using these direct ports. Um, I can also do mobile clients. I can do my SIP integration. Uh, and then I've got all of my various uh, panels. These are my uh, iris panels here and the, and the different varieties. And then obviously a wireless belt pack at the bottom as well. So this card does, as you can see, pretty much, pretty much everything we're interested in these days. So in this particular situation, I've got uh, in the first slot, I've got a, uh, a 1RU panel here. So it's a 1RU lever panel on the face, 12 lever keys. And um, then I've got, sorry, four uh, belt packs set up. Um, so they show up in, in this case here. Uh, and they have different names associated with them. And then I've got, uh, I have my LQ box integrated as well too. So this is doing some remote destination work for me. Um, so this could be remote IFB, things like that. Um, and, uh, and then I've got the mobile client here and that represents my agent IC, uh, um, and in my case, my iPhone app today. And you'll notice uh, with this particular panel, um, under the advanced properties, we have a new section that relates to the IP options. And this is where we can decide on a port by port basis, is this connection going to be the IVC protocol or is it going to be a AS67, excuse me, AS67 or 2110 kind of a kind of a thing. And then we have the ability to set a user ID and a, uh, and a password for that as well. You can do that here. And we also have the ability to select um, the kind of network type. And this basically adjusts the buffering for us. Um, so it doesn't change bandwidth or anything like that. It just spools up the buffer um, and changes the latency just a hair. So um, in a standard network, our IVC protocol, you know, we can see latencies uh, as low as 40, 50 milliseconds for an agent IC or a panel. Uh, and out over the internet, um, depending on how many hops you're making, that could be um, up to 100 milliseconds, 120 milliseconds, but you respectively could be on the other side of the world as well too with, with that connection. So we have the choice per, per option. And if we right click on this, um, this is where we can actually set up the, uh, um, sorry, let's put it on my other screen here. We can set up the actual card itself and designate our network connections. So I mentioned earlier that we had six uh, NIC cards on this card. And um, as you can see, we have different functions uh, of the card here in tabs, and we can pull down each one and we can say we can either have them all use the same one if we want to uh, with varying uh, IP addresses, uh, or we can one by one segregate the units off and uh, they can be on completely separate networks altogether. So in this case, my admin and IVC or that remote or mobile app is coming in on LAN one. Uh, and in this case, I got a fairly flat network here. I'm also using LAN one, uh, but a different subnet of LAN one for the AOIP portion. So my, my FreeSpeak transceivers are running on this and um, uh, any AES67 devices would, would show up on, on this particular jack. Uh, so we can set all that stuff here. And um, because we do support, you know, 2110-10, you know, we have the ability to 
uh, we generate a master PTP v2 clock uh, out of the card for sync for our panels and our and our transceivers. But we can also clock to a grandmaster. You know, we can set ourselves as a slave panel, and we can adjust packet time, PTP profile, and any kind of offsets here using this menu. So. And then um, our Dante card is pretty basic, uh, typically used for trunking, but you'll see in this case, we just have a direct and a trunk port. So um, we can use this for just audio in and out of the system uh, where we're configuring uh, how those tie lines work uh, using a Dante controller, um, like most things. Um, but if we had two matrices tied together uh, over IP, we could also set them up as trunk ports. Um, so we could do dynamic linking uh, via Dante as well. Um, really your, your choice on that part. So once you've got that set up, um, we have a, an IP discovery mechanism here that uh, kind of goes out and, and finds any of our panels and, and things. So this shows you the IP card itself and the, and the devices that are, that are configured for them. And then um, you can see here, oh, I found my one RU uh, V-Series panel and my LQ box. So you can see that they're programmed uh, already, but if I had different devices, it's just a matter of dragging this to the particular port uh, and you'd be up and running. So you could set this up on the same network as the system, no username, no password, nothing. And um, the administrator or yourself could just, uh, if, if the system found it, you could just drag it to the appropriate slot, apply the change to the frame and that panel would be up and active. So it's very straightforward. Um, also under that, we have things like transceivers. So this is where our FreeSpeak uh, Edge and our regular IPT transceivers uh, live. Um, so I have, a, I, have, I have two options here that's kind of unique. I have uh, three transceivers registered to the system, but only two online at the moment. So the first one here is one of our IPT transceivers. Um, so that represents my uh, 1.9 gig version here and my 1.9 belt pack here. Um, and we also have one uh, 5.8 gig edge style, and that represents this guy. And I do have some belt packs back here in the charger as well. So there's a couple, couple more online. But they show up here, and you can see they've got lit with a green section. Um, so you can actually support multiples of these cards in the frame. So you can designate, okay, you know, this antenna corresponds with which card. Um, and you'll notice here we have our frequency and our power settings as well. So this is a bit of a summary view, but um, you can see for the uh, for the IPT, uh, since it operates in the 1.9 gig band, we can't make any changes there. Um, but these two edge transceivers here, um, we can actually, uh, if you click on the line, in this case here, this one's the active one, we can actually come in here and we can adjust our transmit power. Uh, and you can see we've got a pretty hefty output based on what we're allowed in the uh, in the 5.8 gig band up to 24 dBm of output. Um, but we've also got an RF channel uh, one and an RF channel two. Um, so this is where you can kind of come in and override the automated selection made by the, the antennas. So these are all of the available channels in the 5.8 gig band that we can use. Um, now the reason we have two is that um, when they design the system, they wanted to have the most um, robust and, and diverse kind of an option. So every belt pack and every antenna actually has two uh, receivers, two transmitters. So the belt packs and the antennas are always operating on a pair of channels basically. So, and, and the system is constantly monitoring the signal strength and the error rate of, of both of those channels. And it's deciding based on that, which one to use at any given time. So it's kind of like a main and a backup. But in this case, we actually have a, a, a channel one, channel two, and then we actually have a third backup. So they've built in quite a bit of uh, resilience there to any kind of uh, other activity or people trying to use the same bands or things like that. So, so we can adjust the power, the frequency, and then of course we can you know, do our IP configuration here as well. So then we have a detection mechanism here that goes out and searches for our, our antennas. So you can see it's found my, uh, my one edge transceiver here, which is, uh, which is great. Normally they would show up here if they weren't part of your project and it would be just a matter of clicking the green arrow to add it in. So once we've got that set up, um, we can, uh, we can actually do an apply to the matrix and, and make those changes. Um, by doing that, it's just a matter of 
uh, pressing the apply map to matrix, hitting the okay button. That does a build, a download, and a verification. And you can see it's done in about three seconds. So it's, it's very quick and, and, uh, and operational. And these kind of downloads can be done while the system's online. So we have a kind of a map-based system where we're only updating the, the parts of the configuration that have changed. So unless you're doing global hardware changes, things like that, uh, everything can be done while it's online and, and operational. Now, uh, the more interesting part is uh, under the configuration options. So this is where we actually decide what goes on the panels and, and what they're gonna look like. So basically I have a, a visual indication uh, and a drop down of, of all of the programmable devices on the system. So in this case, we have uh, a bunch of edge belt packs programmed and, and configured. Uh, so we'll start with these guys. So you can see here that we, we have our different buttons here. Um, our, uh, we have a couple party lines programmed. Um, we have uh, uh, this one, obviously, I've deleted as part of my the download that I just did because it doesn't know what this was. Um, that's fine. That's that's somewhat normal. And uh, we can see we have these buttons up, up here as well. So these guys are pre-configured for calls. But as I mentioned, we can override that just and drag a, a new option. So we've got these eight buttons, plus we actually have the reply key available to program over top of. So if you're in a fairly flat system where everybody knows everybody else and, and has a button for their respective parties, this reply key isn't really useful. And you can actually use it as a dedicated, uh, a separate dedicated or a ninth uh, talk or listen. And then uh, from our point of view, basically, um, we have our, our programmable options up top. And then down below, we have all the entities and all the things that we can actually program onto the matrix. So it's as simple as doing a, uh, a drag and drop here, I can drag this and throw that right in that slot there. And as you can see, it's, it's lit green by default. And that means that when I press the D button in this case, this will engage a listen to the agent I see uh, channel. But if I right click, I have different activation options. So I can make this a talk. Um, we can see that this is the existing listen. I could change it to a talk and listen. So you don't get anything without the button pressed, but when you press it, you're talking and listening. Uh, talk and forced listen. This is the most commonly one used with wireless belt packs where you're always listening. Uh, you have a volume control, of course, and then you press the button to engage the talk. Um, but if that's not good enough, you can do a dual talk and listen, uh, where again, you have nothing uh, with the button uh, in its uh, normal state. You press once to listen, and then you press again to talk. And then, of course, you can just set up a, a forced listen where the button's basically deactivated and you're forced to listen to a particular uh, destination. So that can be cruel, though, so be careful with that one. Um, so we do that there, and uh, it's, it's as simple as that. We can save these layouts to files. We can copy them. Uh, we can paste them onto other belt packs. So I could, uh, I could go off to my, uh, I could press the copy button here and go off to my next belt pack and I could, uh, I could paste this configuration into this one, and now they're both identical. If I go to my, uh, my panel here, whoops, go to my 1RU panel, we get a very visual indication here of the, of the front of it. Uh, obviously, again, I can uh, drag and drop labels to this guy, and you can do it separately too. So you could set the uh, top half to be a listen to one source, and the talk on the bottom half could be a talk to a different destination. I've done that here. I've got, I'm listening to one party line with the button up and I'm talking to a different one if I wanna do that as well. And one neat thing with these panels is that we have a main page as you see here, but we actually have eight shift keys available. So that's eight more pages of 12 keys that you can independently program um, to listen to different destinations, different rooms. Uh, this is very handy if you are using the Maddie or Dante where you're you know, injecting 64 channels into the system. You could program these onto the shift pages and have access to those uh, pre-fade lessons, anything you like basically. So that gives you over 96 programmable buttons, even on a small, uh, small panel like this. Hey, sorry, just a quick question about yes. uh, the shift keys. Can you uh, also use shift keys on the, uh, the edge wireless belt packs? No, not at the moment. We did used to have that functionality um, in the, uh, the original version of FreeSpeak, but uh, 
it was taken out. I wish it was still there, to be honest. Um, but uh, it kind of it kind of confused the hell out of people. So uh, <laughs> uh, they decided to, uh, to to do away with it for the time being. But I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if that feature found its way back in there. It's not a uh, it's not a hugely complex thing to uh, to do. So it's a good yeah, question, there's though. there's very few people I would give that to, but the people yeah. who would like it would really like it. Well, that's that's the thing. I mean, we've gone from you know people being okay with two buttons, two channels, then you know four or five buttons, and you know once you give them more, they just keep wanting more and more and more. So you know you get to a point where it just doesn't make sense to have like twelve buttons on a belt pack or you know whatever. <laughs> um, one one other unique thing we can do as well um, is. Uh, in terms of dealing with those high channel counts, we can set up uh, something called a, a, a sort group. And what this allows us to do is create a programmable entry. Um, so I can create a new sort group here, uh, the SG1 by default. And then I could come in here and I could grab all my Dante uh, interfaces here. And I could put those guys into the sort group. And um, well, it, doesn't, it could be anything really. In this case, I'm just gonna do these four wires because I've got them uh, programmed here. Let's see if I can do this with the shift key. I'm not sure. So I'll just do it one by one. And what this does is this gives me a single programmable entry, basically, that I can then um, program. Uh, um, just going to call these uh, four Ws. Oh. Sorry, using the wrong keyboard. That's why it's not working. And um, I can now program this to any one of my panels. Um, so you'll see I have now a new tab here. I've got my four Ws. And what I can do is uh, program them up to a key. This works best on rotaries, obviously. But I can trigger this key, and I can actually cycle through the different um, uh, uh, destinations that were part of it based on what I put into the, into the group here. So that one key kind of gives way to, in this case, up to 12 different um, sources or destinations. Um, so you can basically cycle through. And in, in the case of the rotaries, you can just spin the rotary and uh, pick which one of those 12 that you want to talk or listen to and have that key active. So you, you could have a guy walking around with a, with, a, with a wireless belt pack, and they can obviously be programmed on a free speak too. Um, so I could program this up here. And I could engage the sort group here, and I could use this scroll wheel on the belt pack um, to scroll through, you know, up to 64 different channels or however many that you like uh, of audio. So it's great for, you know, if you're an A2 and you've got to, you know, go through a whack of wireless mics and just check them, you can be running around going one by one just on your intercom like this. Well, you still got, you know, five or six or seven buttons programmed for the, you know, for the normal stuff that you need to do. So. That's kind of a neat, uh, a neat feature there. And um, under the diagnostic section, um, we have some interesting um, statistical pages here. So um, this is an overall glance at uh, all the belt packs down the left-hand side that I've got turned on and the antennas. Um, so you can see I've got, a, uh, I've got a, uh, one, one transceiver here and I've got an edge transceiver here uh, and I can see which belt packs are on which antennas. Um, and uh, if I click on any of these, uh, sorry, if I click on any of these belt packs, um, we also have a uh, telemetry graph here. So I can see, let's see if we can get some statistics here. I can see this particular section here um, where uh, this shows me things like battery life. Um, I get my received signal strength. I get my error rate. So I can see that in the red line is quite low here. Um, I get my uh, uh, whichever transceiver that it's on. Um, things like that. So you can see it uh, move around and uh, it's great for troubleshooting because you can see historically where somebody's been, you know, when they trans when they went from this transceiver to this transceiver, the signal, you know, went down or something like that. It's very nice for, for troubleshooting purposes or just having a quick glance at, you know, what's going on with the system or, you know, in this case, this belt pack is going to die, you know, in about an hour or so. So I definitely want to change that battery out. So yeah, there. There's some more useful ones there. And then um, for the network-based portion of it, um, we have a built-in PTP monitor um, status. So uh, the only PTP devices I have running at the moment is uh, two transceivers. Um, so I can have a look at the two devices here. And this shows me a, uh, uh, 
basically the maximum offset in nanoseconds um, for the PTP timing of the system, uh, as well as the uh, mean path delay, which is the overall uh, um, the overall delay from the card to the actual uh, um, to the actual uh, endpoint in this case. Um, so. If you've got lots of devices, lots of network traffic, this is a very valuable page to have a look at just to make sure you know, your QoS is working uh, or if you have a PTP aware switch, uh, you know, everything's getting prioritized properly. Uh, you'll, you know, you'll see vast differences in this page uh, when the switch is handing the, uh, handling the packets in the, in the right uh, priority and, and all of that kind of stuff, especially with other traffic. So this is great for troubleshooting and, uh, and just a general glance at how everything's going and, you know, just net, just general traffic. So. Are, are you guys recommending the switches for the PTP clocking? Uh, just like switches that uh, that enable that correctly? Yeah, and it, it depends. Um, it depends on how many devices that you have. Um, I, I'm not running anything special here, but I've only got a couple of belt packs, a couple of transceivers, so you can get away with, you know, something with QoS and and really something that's not PTP aware. But for any more than a couple of transceivers and, and belt packs, you, I would highly recommend at least a, a nice Luminex switch or at the higher end, you can get some nice Cisco uh, series switches that, that work quite well. Um, in, the, in the large deployment we did with the 400 belt packs, um, we, we did um, uh, Cisco 9300 switches that are PTP aware uh, and they're, they're actually running, the first one is running in boundary clock mode. So it, it is the master clock for the whole system. And the other distribution switches, because there's you know there's there's 50 of these guys spread around, uh, so there's different switches distributing them out throughout the building, and um, they're set up as transparent clocks. But when we set that first switch in the in the unit as the um, the boundary clock mode, our timing got way better. It went way down, and um, and we have a we basically have a seamless you know, connection with those 50 transceivers running simultaneously. So uh, when you get into those numbers, uh, definitely. The, the card itself is good for say 15 to 20 uh, AS67 devices um, being the, the master clock, um, but anything over a couple of them and you, you at least want to have a transparent switch that, that passes the timing properly. And if you're up in the 20 range, you definitely want to have a switch that's, that's boundary clock capable or a grandmaster clock somewhere in there or more or more than one so gotcha. we have a list of uh, switches uh, as well too that uh, that work and <laughs> and some that don't so any other questions uh, guys Great. Well, that's pretty much all I got for today. I mean, we uh, we had a quick look at it, programming these guys and uh, and uh, looking at the transceivers, bringing them online and, and everything. Um, so, I mean, in this particular case, just a quick quick summary. I mean, we've got um, we got the matrix doing most of the heavy lifting. We have one local kind of tech panel, you know, for our field kit today. Uh, we actually have HelixNet um, um, running, uh, network connected in through the LQ box. And the HelixNet gives us our, our wired belt pack capability. So this belt pack is connected over just a standard PoE uh, switch. You can see, have a closer look at that. So it's the nice thing with this is it's PoE capable, but it's also uh, network capable via just a standard XLR line. So I have the choice. I can plug in the PoE or I can just plug in a standard three pin XLR from the HelixNet base and, uh, and run that way. And uh, yeah, there's no limit to the number of these guys you have on a system. Um, it's just a matter of belt packs, panels, and it's really just the endpoints that, that make up these uh, these systems these days. For the uh, edge uh, wireless, uh, is there a plan uh, ahead for the future for any type of standalone base or anything like that, or is it always going to be uh, matrix based? No, nope. uh, actually, good, good, great questions coming out, I think, in the next week or two. Uh, it's been something that's been in development for quite some time. So our standard free speak base, which looks similar to this guy and supports our legacy antennas uh, is great, but it's not, not IP based. So um, with these two, this 1.9 kind of style of transceiver and obviously edge, these are both IP based. They support uh, the 10 belt packs per transceiver these days. So obviously we want to take advantage of that. So 
ClearCom is coming out with a um, a one RU standalone base that's going to support the legacy belt packs. So any any free speak stuff that's around the Toronto area with regular antennas, totally supported or Montreal, of course. Um, but also support the IP transceivers in both regular or, or edge. So you can have all of it running if you want to. Um, it's going to be limited to, I think, 16 belt packs to start, but there'll be no limit to transceivers and, and things like that. So that's amazing for existing uh, FreeSpeak users. Absolutely. I was glad they did that because there's a, there's hundreds of belt packs in, in Ontario and, and in, the pro, in, the, in the country of just regular FreeSpeak stuff with those antennas. So um, to, to not single those people out and to force them to change. I mean, it's nice that, you know, these belt packs, this 1.9 gig belt pack can operate on those legacy transceivers, but also, you know, this style, no change. It's all the same. That That's a nice, a nice option, but to be able to support both transceivers and, you know, give some value to all that stuff that you already own, just swap out the base station, you know, you go a long way with that. Nice upgrade path. I mean, a lot of people will want to upgrade just to get the density. I mean, we used to spec systems on on two things, you know, how many belt packs you had versus what you needed to cover. Um, but now with the 10, 10 per, you don't really have to worry about overloading a transceiver in a given area. Not, not as much at least. So more just about the coverage. With the, uh, um, I kind of, uh, I, when I jumped on, I jumped on my cell phone because I wasn't home yet. So my screen's kind of small. Yeah. But with your, uh, when you're looking at uh, programming the matrix through the software there mm -hmm. and you have the different slots, uh, I'm wondering for a rental situation, um, you know, you're uh, installed at a TV station or anything like that. And pretty much you're not moving cards around. The same cards are going to be there every day. If you want to go home and change the configuration, come back and load it in that's a thing and um with other manufacturers one thing that i've had to uh deal with a lot is actually knowing uh what order the cards are going to be in in the frame ahead of time or specifying that uh so people actually build my frame that way before i get to it if i'm going to build my software ahead is there any way with this that you can basically drag objects from slot to slot in the frame like once you've already pre-configured it yeah uh, so we have the option to copy the card basically to another slot if you want to that's always that's a great question because it's a huge problem to you know configure a 64 port card with all your devices and then realize oh crap it's in the wrong slot you know and i have to do it all over again but you can actually right click on the cards and uh and uh and move or copy them to a uh, to another slot if you have that i mean it's all card based so it's just within the card itself. You can take a whole card and move it to another spot. Um, right. But uh, that at least saves you, you know, some of that pain. At least. It's it's many, a, many hours. <laughs> I know. I, I've been there. I've been there many times. They're never, you know, nobody takes too much, too much of a glance. Is that in the third slot or the fourth slot? I don't know. It looks like the third. Yeah. <laughs> so I know what you mean. So. Yeah, I'll uh, just show you real quick the agent IC thing. Um, I've got it running on my phone here. This is something I would highly suggest um, giving it giving a try. Uh, if you can download this app from ClearCom for free, there's no charges because the licensing is done on on the frame end. Um, so what I've done is I've just logged in here, and I'll show you my my local one here. And uh, you can see I get those party line channels available for for use here. So. I can just slide and link up a talk, uh, slide and link up a listen and, and scroll through the different, uh, the different options. So we have a lot of people use this for IFB feeds too, because so, you can program these, you can give somebody a login and a password with just a talk, no listens, no nothing. You can go either way, obviously, but you could, you could just have a talk to, uh, to something and, uh, and use it that way. Um, so very handy and very straightforward, but part of this is that you can go in now and download this app. And if you were to log in and talk to the production PL, like I am now, uh, you and I could have a conversation. So this is linked up to ClearCom's frame. This particular instance is linked up to their frame in California. I could link it up to this one. Um, but if you and I jumped on here, we could have a conversation and talk through Agent IC. And you, know, you can check out latency and demonstrate it to people, things like that. So. Or if nobody's using it, you can use it as a free intercom system for an hour. So <laughs> your choice. 
that guy in Toronto does very much the same thing with the, his LQ box in his, uh, in his basement. So kind of a neat option. This is a very cost effective and, and cheap wireless intercom if you, uh, if you want. So <laughs> if you trust the Wi-Fi, and I mean, the app is built around uh, uh, different, uh, different speeds and, and loss of data. So it's got lots of padding and buffering built in, but doesn't really push the latency too far either. So um, it's definitely very usable. I, I've measured it a few times and it's never been much over 100 milliseconds. So 